Now, September is recognized as uh, Literacy Month in South Africa and serves to highlight literacy challenges faced by the country and to promote the importance of reading and education. Now, the country's National Book Week is also commemorated and this month and seeks to encourage the nation to value reading as a fun and pleasurable activity, as well as to showcase how reading can easily be incorporated into one's daily lifestyle. Hi, it's your very good evening. My name is Thabo Mulukwani. Welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight we look at the Literacy Month in South Africa, which is commemorated in September each year. Under this umbrella, we take a look at uh, literacy education, early childhood development and multilingual education as we have this conversation. Let me bring in my guest this evening. Joining us via Zoom is educational psychologist Siaho Mapola, who will be sharing his insights and knowledge on these. Siaho, much appreciated for joining us this evening. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Much appreciated. I mean, you know, uh, as we start the conversation, maybe let's get an understanding of what exactly is an educational psychologist and, uh, you know, what are some of the roles that you fulfill? Sure. So an educational psychologist in lay terms would be what people used to call a child psychologist. Uh, we know that obviously it's not that black and white. It has expanded quite a lot since back in the day. Um, so I work with assessments, with therapy, with children and with parents and teachers to ensure that we're able to support children in different levels of their lives in terms of functioning and development. Development has to do with learning. It has to do with career. It also has to do with emotional well-being as well. And so um, I think this conversation about um, our children being able to read and being literate is so important because it, it speaks to so much to um, the ability to function properly in a school setting. Generally, what would be the qualifications that one needs to have in order to work, you know, as an educational psychologist? And also, what are some of those qualities that uh, one would need, you know, to have in order to be a good and effective educational psychologist? Sure. Um, Tabo, it is a very, very long uh, years of study. Um, so I typically would be doing your undergrad, um, two years of postgrad and honors, and then going into masters in educational psychology. And quite importantly, this, um, one of the requirements is that we have to do an internship to ensure that we're able to practically apply the skills learned. Um, then we write the board exam, um, similar to what um, um, people would call the bar exam, so the board exam for psychologists, and then we can start working. So it's a good seven, eight years of, of having to study. And I think one of the main passions is to be able to love children, to be able to give of yourself, and really just to ensure that you're able to fulfill a higher purpose than, than yourself. Um, working in a space like this is quite lucrative financially as well, obviously. Um, however, I think the biggest part is that you have to definitely have the heart for it because it is a lot of hard work that we put into it. Mm. See, I, I want this now to just talk about the numbers. I mean, on the issue of literacy, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, uh, known as UNESCO, you know, has, you know, uh, it, it has reported that uh, 774 million adults worldwide still cannot read or write, with two thirds of them being around 493 million being women. And then they're also reporting that among the youth, 123 million are illiterate, with 73 million of them being females. Then maybe uh, can you paint us a, a picture here on uh, you know how we are looking as South Africa? Where do we currently stand? Uh, as far as our electri you know, our literacy rather uh, is concerned, and uh, you know, is it generally good or bad? Um, sure, I, I want to be very cautious of this because um, the numbers really do look grim. Um, I think in 2016, we were sitting on about, uh, I could be corrected here, about 58%. And then the stats have gone up quite um, significantly since then. We were now sitting well within 70, 80 percentage um, level of children that are not able to read for meaning when they're in grade four. And so that is quite concerning because it means Means that we're only able to identify that children are struggling with literacy levels by the time that they're in grade four, which is about 10 years old. And by then it is, um, you know, so much time has passed um, and it, it, it does take them a little bit longer to remediate the situation and to ensure that there is support. So in terms of our um, 
um, literacy levels in the country, it does not look great. But moreover than that, it is the fact that children actually um, don't have books in the household. They don't have access to single picture books. Um, the, re the recent national reading barometer stats show that three in five homes don't have access to a single fiction or nonfiction book. So you can imagine if it's three in five, then only two homes have access to books. Um, and what does that say about our, our children? What does it say about the families? Do they have access to books at school? Um, and so many kids leave grade one without actually knowing the letters of the alphabet, which is quite scary because if you don't know the letters of the alphabet, it makes it difficult to be able to put them together into words, into sentences and know how to read. Mm. So, um, Siaho, when we speak about literacy and education, a lot of terms come up, uh, you know, that people might not immediately understand. I mean, you look at terms such as learning poverty as well as ECD, uh, which are quite, you know, being thrown around, uh, uh, if I'm going to put it that way. I mean, can you please maybe just help us understand what is meant by these and how we should understand them in a greater context of literacy? So when we talk about literacy levels, it's important to know that literacy doesn't just start at school. Firstly, it starts with pre-literacy skills at home, and that is being done as early as, I'm sure a lot of us have seen pictures of people reading to their children while they're in utero. Um, and even when children are small, being able to read to them to ensure that you use the tone of your voice to enunciate certain um, emotions and words in the text that you're reading. And by the time they are of school going age, so like the creations of the early childhood development centers, that is when we also just try to ensure that there's recognition of numbers, recognition of of um, alphabets to ensure that by the time they get to school now, where they have to learn to put the words, the, the alphabets together to read, then they, they're able to have the literacy skills. So it is a process that we look at when we think about reading. It's not like a one-time event where a child sees a word and automatically they know what it means. It is a process where as parents and guardians, we have to expose our children to the books. We have to read to them first before we can expect them to read. And then it really just becomes a process of being able to help them identify the words, identify the alphabets and how to put them together to decode and do all of this stuff. Um, and I think quite critically is that when we read to our children as well, we need to ensure that we are asking them questions about the text that we've read to mm. ensure that there's that reading for meaning aspect that we often overlook. Mm. Um, my guest this evening is educational psychologist Siaho Mapola, who joins us via Zoom as we speak on literacy, multilingual education and early childhood development as we recognize Literacy Month in South Africa. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we continue the conversation. Do stay with us. Welcome back, you're still watching So It's Today. Much appreciated for joining us this evening. Now, before the ad break, we started the conversation on literacy, multilingual education, as well as early childhood development, as we recognize Literacy Month in South Africa. We continue the conversation with our guest, Yah Mapola, who is the educational psychologist. She continue joining us uh, via Zoom. Yah much appreciated for staying on. I mean, uh, you know, International Literacy Day 2024 was recognized on the 8th of September and uh, this year UNESCO's theme was promoting multilingual education, literacy for mutual understanding and peace. What exactly is multilingual education and also what does it practically entail? That's such a great question. So in a country like ours, where we have such diverse cultures and languages, it's important to know that there isn't one language that is more important than the, the next. And so when we speak about multilingual education, um, it speaks to a child or families being able to communicate in the, their mother tongue as well as other languages that are spoken in the home. Oftentimes we will have a dad from one language who speaks a different language than the mom and then there's a granny who also speaks a different language. So it's being able to expose our children to the languages that are spoken in the home in addition 
to the language that is spoken at school as well, especially if a child goes to an English medium school, an Afrikaans medium school, um, and then so they're able to speak the different languages. And there's a little bit of a misconception that um, it's important to only speak to our children in English because they learn in that language anyway. However, research shows us that if they're able to communicate in their mother tongue uh, or the, the language that's spoken in the home, if it is now a different language than English, they have a point of reference and they are able to learn um, quite well. They're able to, to adjust quite well when they move over to English. And so it's important that we know that our mother tongues matter. And in a context like ours, that we're able to make space and really recognize and celebrate the beauty and diversity that is South Africa. You know, Siaho, I, I like how you put it, especially when you're saying that, uh, you know, uh, you know, in a household, you would have a father and a mother, uh, you know, just uh, speaking different languages and making sure that at least the child knows all those languages. Uh, 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 but, you know, I'm interested in finding out normally uh, what happens in, 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 in schools. I mean, you look at, at township schools normally, uh, you would, uh, you know, get a period or uh, a, a learning lesson that is being done by both English and the language of that community. How effective is that? Um, I think it's quite important to firstly um, distinguish that if there are any speech um, um, pathology issues, if there are any um, traumatic incidents, if there are emotional challenges, all of these things do affect language and speech, right? So if a child is struggling to read and to communicate, we just need to first find out that there aren't any underlying issues yeah. that might be um, challenging to the child. Um, and then with regards to your, to your question, I think it's quite important that we're able to teach our children to learn in their mother tongue, to establish that and make that firm, and then move over to a second language, which would then be the language of, of teaching in the school. Um, however, if a child is facing difficulty in establishing one language and then you introduce another one, it does cause a little bit of language confusion. And so my perspective would be to ensure that if we are going to then build onto um, a lesson by introducing English, the understanding is that these children are able to understand the mother tongue. And that's why we're adding on English to ensure that they're able to learn and, and grasp the language. Um, but if they're struggling in their mother tongue and you're also not adding a different language, that is going to cause a little bit of a challenge. And so um, the, the hope is that the teachers obviously then know that the children are able to communicate and to understand that first language, and therefore able to add on a second language. Mm. Um, so um, uh, when we talk about the teachers in the country, are... Uh they already trained enough to administer, uh, you know, a multilingual education, or do we need any, you know, any additional training and support there? That is a very controversial question that you're asking me. Um, I do want to say this. I think that our teachers need a lot of support because they are overwhelmed with the admin with class size and we know that teaching especially post covid has become um, a very complicated vocation whether you're not just a teacher but you're a nurse you're a social worker you're a mom you're you're all of these things and so it is important that we're able to support our teachers before we can expect them to do um you know all these additionals that we require of them um, and then the second part is um for a lot of young teachers that are getting into the profession oftentimes when they get into the profession sometimes it is a plan Z because all the other things that I applied for I wasn't accepted for and then uh, let me try teaching and then I get in for that so for some of the teachers it's not actually like a passion or something that I want to do it's yeah. a everything else has failed so I'm going to get into this um, and so it's quite important that we're able to just put that um, at the back of our minds as well um, so definitely a lot needs to be done uh, we do need to have more training more support from government um, to ensure that our teachers are well equipped to give our children the literacy skills that they need because it's such a specialized field of work. Mm, I mean, speaking about government there, let's talk about on a grander scale. I mean, how would the education syllabus and system need to adjust in order for multilingual education to be successful, you know, uh, to be successfully administered and also to bridge the education and literacy gap that we find in the country? I mean, I know you've highlighted the fact that also as parents, we need, you know, to take initiative and make sure that we get those books in our households. We read uh, to our children for meaning. Uh, 
and also ask questions in this regard. But how do we get the syllabus to, you know, move towards the direction also? Again, another difficult one to answer because firstly, because we have so many languages, um, it's important to think about which languages in the syllabus are going to be prioritized because to try and do everything all at once is going to be quite a bit of a, a difficult task to do. And so it's important to think about which languages are we going to, to fit into the curriculum to ensure that we're able to support um, our children. The teachers need to be proficient in the language that is going to be taught. The children would need to have access to books that are multilingual or within that language. And oftentimes, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, when I go to the local library, a lot of the books that are uh, multilingual are very old, not age appropriate at yeah. all. Um, and it's not really attractive and appealing to children. So we also need to be able to find books that are um, relatable. So when children are reading them, they're able to see themselves in the stories that are told. They see themselves as the heroes, as the problem solvers. Um, and I know, especially at ECD centers in underprivileged areas, they don't have access to a lot of the books. And so one of the initiatives that I feel is absolutely amazing and I've read so much about is the Read with Wimpy initiative, where they go around the country giving underprivileged, underprivileged ECD centers um, access to the multicultural and multilingual books. And in, in, in addition to that, the books have comprehension aids to ensure that children are then asked questions. And so they're really giving the resources to the teachers to say, this is the toolbox that you need to assist our children when it comes to reading. Because by investing in them at an early age, we are actually investing in the future generation of the country. Siaho, I want us to pocket that we're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, let's wrap up the conversation, uh, touch on uh, you know the solutions. What is it that we need to do as a country to improve uh, those numbers? Let's take a quick uh, short breather. We're coming back after this. Welcome back to So What's It Today. Much appreciated for joining us. We are getting closer to the end of the show, but we still continue the conversation on literacy, multilingual education and early childhood development as we are about to bring uh, National Book Week to a close this week. Educational psychologist Siaho Mapola has been our guest this evening and she continues to join us uh, via Zoom as we wrap up the conversation. Siaho, as we wind down the conversation now, I want to talk about solutions now. What is the way forward? I mean, uh, we have spoken about the structural challenges that uh, we would like to see that could affect, you know, effect change in literacy and education overall. But uh, what can parents, guardians and children start to do now to make, uh, you know, to start to make a difference? I mean, you've touched on a very important aspect that you go to libraries and you find uh, books that are not really appealing now. Uh, uh, you know, there are initiatives that are, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, various um, uh, organizations are having across the country. But how do we make sure that, uh, you know, we deal with uh, the crisis at hand? Um, I love the question, and I think it's it's definitely a multi-layered one. So the first thing for me would be um, we need to invite corporate South Africa to also partner with government, to partner with communities and with schools to ensure that we're able to give our children access to the books that they so desperately need. Um, secondly, you know, oftentimes when I speak about um, us as parents and guardians reading to our children, the conversation is always, oh my word, where am I going to find time to read to my child? And honestly, it doesn't have to take an hour out of your day. It could be um, a five, 10 minute uh, um, reading session where you're reading to your child, asking them questions. It's also a very nice way to bond because again, research shows us that um, children learn better and they learn really well in a space where they feel safe and there's trust. So we also need to use that to add advantage as, as parents. Um, and I think communities, in terms of we, if you have access to books that you're no longer reading, let's donate those books to the school. Um, let's let's have a drive. Let's do let's be proactive to ensure that we're able to um, really give the books um, to the children where they need to go. Because I think for me, the point of reference is being able to give the children access to the books that they need. Mm. Um, uh, you know, September is Literacy Month with International Literacy Day as well as the National Book Week also being recognized within this month. But, you know, as far as you're concerned, um, are these awareness days or weeks or months truly effective, uh, you know, or do they just come and go without much of a difference being made? 
Um, I think they are raising a lot of awareness, which is great because now we know that, um, you know, previously we were sitting at 58% of children that didn't have books and now we're at 68% or 63% rather. So we are definitely making um, strides in bringing awareness to this, uh, but awareness isn't enough. You know, like you said, we now need to move into the action phase of things to say, what are we going to do? And I think it is through these conversations, through these awareness campaigns, where we can actually, um, you know, ask corporate South Africa and ask communities to come on board and say, hey, how can we help? Could this be part of your CSI project where you are able to partner with communities in underprivileged areas that don't have access to books? So I think we have a long way to go, um, but we're definitely on the right track because one of the stats that also mentioned that um, although children are struggling to have access to books, they actually do have a need and a desire and a passion to read. And I think we need to capitalize on that interest that the children have to read because if we lose them completely, then it's going to be quite difficult. And so um, I do think that we're on the right track. Mm. Um, uh, Xiaohu, now as a parent and uh, you know a guardian, when would I need to make use of uh, you know the services of uh, people like yourselves and educational psychologists? And also, what should I be looking out for in my child uh, when, in order for me to know whether I need uh, you know uh, to get professional help? Mm. Very great question. So I think first and, and foremost, it's important that as parents, we are involved in our child's schooling. They don't leave in the morning and come back. And by the time they come back, now they're done with school and they're done with homework. We need to be actively involved. Sit with them and see, you know, have you done your homework? Check that the book is marked. Um, help them maybe read a few sentences in the book. And if we have any concerns as parents, it's so important to have a good relationship with your child's teacher to ask, hey, at home when we do homework, I've noticed one, two, three, what is your take on it? Yeah. So really having open communication with your child's teacher is so crucial. That's first and foremost. They'll be able to flag certain things for you. Uh, we'll be able to provide some support that is needed. And um, secondly, if by the, I mean, typically between seven and eight, that's when a child is supposed to know um, certain words and, and have an idea of how to read and have a certain level of comprehension. And if at that stage, you know, that the child is still struggling with identifying words, um, identifying alphabets and numbers, or the reversing numbers or anything of the sort, again, it's important that you're able to reach out. If there is any barrier to your child being able to learn and develop in the way that they're supposed to, that is when you should be able to ask for help. And I know, for example, in um, um, government schools, um, the Department of Education does have educational psychologists that are able to provide assessments. They are educational specialists. They are curriculum. There are a lot of people that are there to support. But obviously, we don't have enough manpower. And so people would typically then reach out to us in the private sector to see how mm. we can assist. Um, but I think if you're concerned as a parent, trust your gut feeling don't let it go speak to the teacher speak to the hod and the principal to say hey i'm quite concerned about one two three with my child how can we support um, them to ensure that they're able to progress well just lastly before i let you go uh siaho when can people go to research and find out more on multilingual education you know early childhood development as well as how to ascertain what kind of educational psychologists would be best suited for my child's needs and also just lastly, are you confident that, uh, you know, we are in the right direction as a country in order to deal with this issue? I think we are definitely in the right direction, but lots needs to be done. Um, I'm, 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 I'm confident in the fact that we have specialists and we have people that are passionate that want to make a change. Um, because I think, you know, being a naysayer and being hopeless is not going to help us in any way. Um, I do think that I have a lot of, of um, confidence in the fact that there are people that are coming on board and partnering with the government. Um, I had a recent conversation with another um, um, colleague who said people are actually donating books and people are saying, how can we get involved? And so the country is definitely aware of the fact that there's a, there's a need and they want to partner with different um, you know, uh, companies and organizations. Whether that's going to take five years or 10 years, we don't know. But I do think that it is going to take a little bit of time. And we need to be OK with the fact that it's going to take time. Um, and then with the other question as well, is that, um, you know, how do you know 
where can you go for more information? Uh, there's information on the internet all the time about our literacy levels. So all you need to go and do is read about literacy levels on the internet. There are so many platforms that pop up. I know, for example, News24 has just had an article. Um, I mean, so many uh, publications are speaking about this because it's such an apt conversation currently. Um, and like I said, if you're concerned about anything, speak to your child's teacher who will be able to direct you to um, the, the Department of Education District Office to see how they can support. Alternatively, there is also, um, you know, in the areas where people live, they just need to Google educational psychologists near me and then um, different information will pop up and then you'll be able to find out about rates, um, where they're located, what exactly do you need? Is it more therapy based or is it, is it an assessment that you need? Little things like that. But support is there. All we need to do is reach out. Sia, how much appreciate it for joining us. That was very insightful. Thank you so much for your time. That was uh, Sia Homopola, an educational psychologist there who joined us this evening to discuss literacy, multilingual education and early childhood development as, uh, you, you know, we bring South Africa's National Book Week to a close. Now that's how we wrap up today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you, so please feel free to talk to us about this episode. Send us an email. It's Soweto Today at SowetoTV.co.za. Call us or WhatsApp us at 081-531-8857. For hi, it's your Lehole Kani, Nagatabu Mulokwani and the rest of the team. It's good night from us and thank you for watching.